Um, for our panelists, we have, of course, Senator Eaton. Uh, Senator Eaton, uh, who's also, I believe you're still the Majority Whip, correct? Yes, the Majority Whip, um, also the State Senate. Uh, we also have Dr. Kirk Allison, who's the Program Director in the Program in Human Rights and Medicine at the University of Minnesota. Uh, we also have Dr. Jonathan Sandy, who's the Ethics Program Director at St. Mary's Medical Center. Uh, and we also have Dr. David Mayo, but most people refer to him as Doc. Right? So, Dr. Doc Mayo uh, as well. And he is a professor emeritus from here at good old University of Minnesota Duluth. In fact, uh, he was a former professor of mine, so I'm elated to have him here on the panel. Um, now, the way that this panel is, is going to work is that each participant will come up here for a 10 minute initial presentation. After those 10 minutes go by, um, and we have all the presentations done, then the panelists will discuss amongst each other. Um, of course, you'll hear. Uh, you'll, uh, for about, I'd say, 20 to 30 minutes, uh, we'll be able to ask each other questions. After that, uh, we will then open it up to Q&A from the audience. Now you'll notice when you came in here that there are mics on both sides. Uh, and what will end up happening is, is that we'll allow for lines to form up on each side, and then I'll oscillate and pick one person there, then one person there, then one person there, right, for questions. Um, and that will end us for the evening. Um, so about this particular talk in general, um, I know that sometimes these things can get heated at times uh, because a lot of people are heavily invested in the issue. Uh, most of us here, and this is kind of a spoiler alert, are going to die. <laughs> um, maybe not today, hopefully not today. I, I don't think we have insurance for that. Um, but uh, eventually you will. And the good news is that healthcare has gotten better to the point where we're able to, say, delay that inevitable outcome just a little bit longer. Now, the question that, that often comes about is whether or not delaying it in and of itself is a good goal, that maybe we shouldn't delay it. Now, of course, there's always this question about whether or not you should stop care if it's not beneficial. But the question we're asking here today is even more than that. It's not just necessarily, you know, not say, seeking further care, but actually perhaps hastening death, right? And whether or not that uh, is an appropriate goal for the health profession, whether or not it's good social policy, uh, whether or not there are unintended consequences of having such policy, uh, whether or not it's the appropriate way to respect the individual patient by allowing them to have you know, their freedom respected or their autonomy respected to make that sort of ultimate choice. Right? These are all very pertinent questions, and I'm extremely grateful that the panelists took time out of their schedule freely. I didn't know if you know it was free. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, oh, you got one. That's true. That is true. Uh, to come out here and um, actually participate in what I, what I think to be a very important discussion, uh, and, and I'm happy that the center can participate in this. So, um, without further ado, why don't we open it up to Senator Eaton. So, the Minnesota Compassionate Care Act. Um, I am the chief author, and by Senate File 1880, as Shane said, and it is modeled after the Oregon's um, 1997 Death with Dignity Act. Why do we need this bill? Well, patient autonomy and control is the number one reason. This bill would allow terminally ill patients access to medication so they can end their suffering by painless means if and when they choose. Patients are put in control of their medical choices and given the option to decide when they've suffered enough. The scientific advancements in medicine and technology have allowed us to extend life longer than ever before. And as Brittany Maynard's mother, Debbie Ziegler, told the California legislature that prolonging and intensifying suffering is not the same thing as extending life. I believe this is why 20 states had this legislation introduced this year. What it's not, it's not euthanasia. This legislation does not allow lethal injections and it requires that the person wishing to use this option to be able to self-administer the medication. It's not suicide. As Brittany Maynard <coughs> said, there is a difference between a person who is suicidal who is dying, I do not want to die, I am dying. As a registered nurse working with adults with mental illness, I strongly oppose assisting anyone in need of mental health uh, services to end his or her life. 
Aid in dying gives those who are close to death with no chance of recovery an alternative when their agony becomes unbearable. There, it isn't murder, they are dying. If nothing is done, they will die. They take the medication themselves. No one can make the decision for them. They can decide not to use the medication at any point. And there aren't any death panels. The decision is made between the dying person and their doctor. No one has the right to make this decision for anyone else. Oregon passed this law in 1997, and we have almost 18 years now of data from how it's worked there. Washington, 2009. Montana by court in 2009. Vermont, 2013. New Mexico, my understanding is the court decision was made last month that the higher court overturned the lower court, and they no longer have this option, aid and dying. And then in California on October 5th, the uh, Governor Jerry Brown in California signed their bill. So they have it. Minnesota, we're working on it. Gallup polls have shown that since 1997, when Oregon's law went into effect, 65 to 75 percent of Americans supported that this and that terminally ill patients should be allowed to ask for and receive aid from a doctor to end their life by a painless means. The 2014 Harris poll showed 74 percent support. Um, Bill, who qualifies? You have to be an adult, so you have to be over 18, and you have to have be a resident of the state. You have to be terminally ill. You have to have had a doctor or physician that says that you are um, six months have a terminal six months to prognosis, and that you are of sound mind. The physician is then to provide the patient a list of alternatives, and um, including hospice and pain management specialists, along with palliative care. They would um, they would give the oh the patient. I'm sorry, I jumped ahead. The patient should submit a written request, and they have to have two witnesses: one who is not um, does not have an interest in the outcome, and. Um, then the physician would determine if they're eligible, all the things I stated before, and then they provide them a list of alternatives, including hospice, pain management, and palliative care. The physician would then refer them to a second physician for confirmation of eligibility. Um, if a second opinion does not concur, no action will be taken until a comprehensive mental health evaluation is completed and the patient is cleared. If a second opinion is in agreement, the person is then to submit a written request no earlier than 15 days from the first request. Before the prescription is written, the physician must confirm that the person is acting voluntarily and free from coercion. The physician needs to then offer alternatives and make sure the patient is aware of hospice, pain management, and palliative care options. They also must offer the option to change their mind and rescind their request. And finally, they must counsel the patient on how to use the medication and what to expect once they take it. The safeguards, no insurer or uh, provider is required to participate. And a healthcare institution may prohibit employed doctors from participating. Um, making a terminal diagnosis, however, may not be construed as participating in aid and dying. And there is liability protection as long as um, those, as long as the uh, they follow the legal process. <coughs> a person does not qualify solely on the basis of their age, their diagnosis, or their disability. In Oregon, from 1998 to 2014, there were 1,327 prescriptions written. 859 were actually used. The number one diagnosis was cancer, 78%. After that, you had ALS, heart lung disease, and other illnesses. 90% of the people who used this were in hospice already. The reasons they gave for using the Death with Dignity Act was, number one, 92% loss of autonomy. And then you had 
the 89% less able to engage in activities that make life enjoyable, 79% loss of dignity, 50% loss of control of body functions, 25 inadequate pain control, and 3% indicated that financial implications of treatment was part of their decision making. Brittany Maynard. <coughs> Um, <coughs> Brittany Maynard was diagnosed with stage 4 brain cancer at 29 years of age. When she heard the prognosis of unrelenting pain, seizures that would lead her to be unable to speak with gradual decline into paralysis, blindness, and dementia, she and her entire family moved to California from, or I mean, to move to Oregon from California so that she'd be able to live her final months knowing that she was in control should her symptoms become too much to endure. She ended her life a year ago on November 1st, 2014, on her own terms, at peace and surrounded by her loved ones. Since then, her husband and parents have become spokespeople for aid and dying legislation in their home state of California, and the End of Life Option Act became law last Monday, as I said, when Governor Jerry Brown signed it. Um, most of the people who use this law are um, white, upper income, highly educated, and over 65. Thank you also to the University of Minnesota, Duluth Center for Ethics and Public Policy, and especially to Dr. Portland for your gracious invitation. I've come to know Shane since his return to Duluth, and I very much value his commitment to challenging, honest, and respectful conversation on important issues. Our general topic tonight the kind of care we provide to those who are dying is certainly such an issue. As do all of us, oh, sorry, as do all of us, I come to this evening formed by experiences. Mine include, I am the son of two deeply loved parents, both now in their late 80s, one of whom who has been very close to death several times in the last two years, the other with significant dementia. I am the husband whose wife is 20 months out from a significant breast cancer diagnosis. I am also a non-Catholic clinical ethicist who works in a Catholic hospital. And I am an oncologist who has been involved in the care of thousands of patients as they have approached their end. <clears throat> Lastly, I'm the director of an advanced care planning program whose primary goal is to ensure that my organization <coughs> The care my organization provides is person-centered, family-oriented, evidence-based, and informed by patient beliefs, goals, and values. I'm here with you this evening representing Essentia Health. If I offer a personal opinion tonight, I will clearly identify it as my own. Essentia is an integrated system spanning four states, Minnesota, Wisconsin, North Dakota, and Idaho, we have nearly 14,000 employees, nearly 1,800 physicians and advanced practitioners, and many facilities. Essentia Health integrates secular and Catholic facilities. The sponsors of our Catholic facilities, including St. Mary's Medical Center here in Duluth, are the Benedictine Sisters of St. Scholastica Monastery. Essentia is grateful for Dr. Portland's invitation to participate this evening. We want to be a part of this conversation. The care we provide to the dying is very important for the patients and communities we serve. And it is also very important for our organization. The particular issue before us tonight, the Minnesota Compassionate Care Act of 2015, is also important. This proposed legislation, however, is only a small part of a larger and much more important issue, and that is the quality of care our state and nation provide to the seriously ill and dying. Adequate discussion of this proposed legislation needs to take this larger context into account. The remainder of my opening, opening remarks will first describe experiences I have had working with patients and families at the end of life. Second, discuss some issues those working to improve end-of-life care in this country must address. And third, present Essentia's overall view of the proposed 
legislation. I've been directly involved in patient care since 1983. In these 32 years, I have been privileged to care for thousands of dying patients. I have heard, seen, and learned many things. In all this time, patients have raised what we are so far tonight calling aid and dying questions have raised only two or three dozen times. In each situation, I did my best to respectfully explore concerns, anxieties, and fears driving these questions. And I committed to addressing each issue as completely as I could. These relationships and concerns were addressed, and over time, aid and dying questions lost their importance and were no longer raised. This is a common experience for those of us who work in hospice and palliative care. I want to express profound gratitude to the patients and families I have served. I was drawn to oncology for many reasons. First amongst these was my desire to help patients and families in difficult situations, and especially when cure seemed unlikely. Relationships with patients and families are extremely important to me. Indeed, as the end approaches, the relationship may be the single most important thing a healthcare professional can offer. Over time, some relationships became those in which core questions of human existence are easily discussed. What does suffering mean to you? What does hope mean to you? What does joy mean to you? And how can we help you and your loved ones create and express joy in the time you have left? Such patients and families have been my mentors in the most profound sense of that term. They used their death as a lens to focus on what was most important to their living. As they approached the end, they demonstrated patience, dignity, compassion, and profound gratitude and joy. In referencing these experiences, I am not complaining, uh, claiming perfection for me, Essentia Health, or any other healthcare organization in which I have worked. On the contrary, such experiences reveal how much work all of us, all of us, have to do to make excellent end-of-life care available to all. Nor am I claiming that such experiences should or even can occur with every patient and family. Rather, these experiences demonstrate a human ability to generate meaning and joy in the midst of dark circumstances and a need for caution in hastening the death of those we believe to be terminally ill. It has been very clear for a long time that there are significant problems in healthcare in the United States, including at the end of life. Thirteen months ago, the Institute of Medicine published a report entitled Dying in America, Improving Quality and Honoring Individual Preferences Near the End of Life. This influential report reconfirms, not that we needed it, that our nation fails to meet the needs of our terminally ill and dying patients. Causes include lack of appropriate education for medical professionals, misaligned financial incentives, lack of public engagement, and much more. Improving our nation's care of the seriously ill and dying requires sober analysis, hard work, cooperation across many different interests, and personal responsibility. Three years ago, the East Region of Essentia Health conducted an internal review of our performance in end-of-life care. We found multiple areas needing significant improvement. Our conclusions predated, but are in general agreement with, the 2014 IOM report. We are engaged in several initiatives to address these areas. One example is our advanced care planning program. The patient and their agent, that is, the person the agent would want to speak for them if they were no longer able to speak for themselves, are engaged to participate in a 90-minute facilitated conversation in their home or clinic. Uh, we don't charge for these services. With non-directive techniques, we explore the patient's values and beliefs concerning their illness, their concerns about the future, their hopes for their treatment, and what living well means to them. 
we ensure that the agent understands the importance of their role and are capable of fulfilling it. The most challenging part of the discussion is working through several hypothetical scenarios in which the patient has experienced a life-limiting complication of their disease. This process requires then that the patient explore their goals and values within particular medical situations and gives the patient and agent the opportunity for important discussions before a crisis occurs. <coughs> this information is placed in the patient's electronic medical record and is easily available for the healthcare team. Advanced care planning is only one example of efforts underway at Essentia to improve our care. Our mission, vision, and values ground a commitment to strive for excellence in the care we provide. We carry an important legacy from our Benedictine sponsors. We value compassion. We value human dignity. We value relief of suffering. We value human life. We also believe that all of us in this room value these things. Certainly our understanding of compassion, human dignity, suffering, and human life is likely different and leads us to different conclusions regarding the proposed legislation. That is the importance of the kind of conversation Dr. Cortland has invited tonight, and I hope we have a detailed and valuable discussion on where and why we differ. For now, I will simply state that Essentia Health is committed to a different vision of end-of-life care than that implied by the proposed legislation. We believe our vision leads to better patient care. This vision includes fully developed and integrated palliative care, hospice, and advanced care planning services, and a holistic and intensive approach to reduce suffering in all of its forms, physical, emotional, financial, social, and spiritual. Thank you for listening, and I look forward to our discussion. I joined the Hemlock Society back in the 80s. I served on the board of directors of the Death to Dignity National Center. Uh, I'm a uh, non-techie, so I hope everybody has a handout, which uh, uh, Shane lovingly provided at the uh, I want to start by, uh, by conceding, uh, indeed insisting, that, that hospice care is, is the Cadillac of the end-of-life care. I'm, I'm totally in favor of hospice, uh, and I think that they do extraordinary things. But I want to put a little leaf on Senator Eaton's uh, fairly abstract description of, of the sort of death for which this would be possible by describing him my father's decline. At 92, he had lost his wife to Alzheimer's. He had lost a partner to a stroke uh, followed by uh, her death uh, in this in August of 90, sorry 2002, having commented a number of times to me, all my friends are gone. He was hospitalized with uh, colon cancer, emergency surgery. He came out of the surgery, and his first words were, "If this recurs, I'm not going to do it again." Uh, he decided to move east where there were a lot more males to look after him, and so I saw him through closing out his house. I remember he was sitting there fiddling and saying that the fingers don't work anymore, the eyes don't work anymore. He moved east into a nice assisted living place. He never could quite get the hang of it, and then the colon cancer occurred to the account to the point that he couldn't eat. So we entered hospice, and I was present during the first hospice interview where at the end of the discussion with the nurse, paperwork completed, uh, he says, the sooner this is over with, the better. Which is, well, of course we can't do anything to speed your death, but we'll do everything we can to keep you comfortable. And when she left, he said, well, I just won't even try to eat anymore. And his son, at that time on the board of the Hemlock Society, said, well, that could take quite a while if you quit drinking anything, if you dehydrate yourself, which is not terrible, this will go a lot faster. And we got him a little tippy cup that he could keep ice in so he could keep his mouth moist. And after about a week, he became delirious, at which point he was put on medication and about three days later lapsed into a coma, at which point the hospice people presented his son 
as a member of the, of the Hemlock Society, with a bottle of morphine, which I was told was enough to kill probably 50 people who weren't already on morphine. And the instructions were to have this on his gums just to keep him comfortable. Uh, uh, but be careful not to give him too much, he could choke. Uh, so uh, he slipped away about three days later, and my view of that was that no good was served. No good was served. There was no family business left to be done. Uh, there was no leopard counseling available or offered. He just wanted to go. Now the case for compassion I think is straightforward, but I just want to emphasize a little the case for control. And I refer you to the handout where the uh, book by Dr. Eric Cassell. And I ask you to think about illnesses you've had, old and young. If I had to pick some aspect of illness that is the most destructive to the sick, I would choose loss of control. Suggestion. Many, many medical problems are not bad because they hurt. They're bad because you can't do what you want to do. Maintaining control over oneself is so vital to all of us that one might see all other phenomena of illness as doing harm, not only in their own right, but doubly so as they reinforce the sick person's perception he's no longer in control. Thus, the doctor's job is to return control to his patient. And when you're dying, you don't have much control left. When Jerry Brown, who, by the way, had spent time in the seminary, and who, by the way, the people on the board of DDNC were worried might get a call from the boat while he was in town, uh, uh, wrote a uh, remark when he signed the bill, I did not know what I should what I would do if I were dying in a prolonged and excruciating pain. I am certain, however, that I, it would be a comfort to be able to consider the options afforded by this bill. So I think the case for control uh, at the end is a, is a very important one. There are many people, as uh, 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 Senator Eaton's numbers point out, who get the medication, and just having the medication makes a tremendous difference. That puts you in control. I want to advance an, uh, a, an argument which really anticipates an objection, which is that this is risky, dangerous, who knows where it could go, with a very, very quick summary of the uh, progress in medicine that Chain referred to at the outset. Uh, Willard Galen, a prominent bioethicist, uh, once remarked that uh, medicine really probably did more harm than good until about 1930 or 40. It, it wasn't until the late 1800s that germ theory was accepted. Simon Weiss, Pasteur, uh, Mr. Lister uh, uh, were pretty sure that germs were a source of a lot of problems. That was not accepted until late in the 1800s, which meant that surgery was uh, completely out of question. Anesthetics were very primitive. Uh, uh, hospi hospitals were, were not places where healthcare was provided, it was just a place where people were looked after. Little could be done, and so typically people died quickly and often uh, very young at or uh, of childbirth, influenza, pneumonia, scarlet fever, cold war, measles, or other uh, infectious diseases, or gastritis. Uh, the little house on the prairie scenario, uh, if the fever breaks, you're fine. If it doesn't, you're gone. I recommend a book by Atul Gawande to anyone who thinks they might die. It's called Being Mortal. And he describes a curve of life, which back in the 1800s went along at a pretty good level and then typically dropped quickly. Old age was not a common phenomenon. And he compares that to the line we have now, where they're doing pretty well for quite a while, but then there's a slow decline uh, because of all of the things we can do. What can we do with antiseptics? Of course, all sorts of things are possible. There have been terrible sanitation. People appreciate that sanitation was important. There were anesthetics, there were surgeries, modern hospitals, antibiotics in the 40s, uh, dialysis in the 60s, transplantation, implantable devices, insulin, resuscitation devices, ICUs, uh, and genetic engineering, new understanding of diseases, uh, and radically new diagnostic techniques. So things are very different today. I refer you to, this, to the quote on the page from the President's Commission on Bioethics, who wrote in 1982, 
without removing a sense of loss, finality, and mystery that have always accompanied death, new developments have made death more a matter of deliberate decision. For almost any life-threatening condition, some intervention can now delay the moment of death. The bottom line is, last sentence, matters once the province of fate have now become a matter of human choice. That is, people typically die not when literally nothing more can be done, but when someone decides enough is enough. Now about the time that medicine came of age, there was a change in medical ethics. Up until this time, the principle that governed medical ethics was that the doctor did whatever he thought he possibly could for a long life. And you'll see in the first quote that it, uh, Hippocrates remarks, I'll apply measures for the benefit of the sick, sorry, according to my ability and judgment. But beginning in the 60s, we saw the crazy notion that people had a right to know what was going on. There were articles in medical journals about whether you should tell cancer patients they had cancer or whether that would be too depressing. And this gave way to the view that people have a right to know what's going on, and they not only have a right to know, but they have a right to consent or to withhold consent, even if withholding consent means they will die. So at this point, people began to have the right to decide when enough was enough. Um, let me, let me, uh, let me press ahead here. Uh, This took the form not only of patients saying, I don't want that treatment. As my father said, I don't want further surgery. Many of the cases involved incompetent patients, the case of Karen and Quinlan and Cruzan, of Shivo, very often when people are near death are not competent, so some proxy has to make a decision. Uh, the advent of living wills, it turned out living wills were working very well, uh, so the notion of advanced directives was urged. Uh, there's the quote from the uh, Patient Self-Determination Act. The federal government came on board encouraging and indeed requiring that everybody entering a hospital that gets federal funding be at least asked if they have a living will. Forgive the Rubio here. Uh, the, uh, there is a, a wonderful uh, 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 project uh, uh, that uh, uh, called the Conversation Project. If you Google the Conversation Project, you'll find a little worksheet to think through what you want to put on your living will. Living wills and advanced directives still are not highly, uh, highly successful. But the courts have con confirmed that people have a right not only to refuse surgery, they have a right to refuse food, they have a right to refuse hydration, they have a right to have their implanted defibrillator turned off, uh, even if that means that they will be dead uh, very shortly. A second move is the move that we've just heard about, is the move to palliative care. Uh, palliative care really became a serious issue, I think, in the 90s. A little more than half the hospitals in the, in the uh, country have hospices now. Uh, and I refer you to the back of the sheet. And this really brings me to the final argument I want to offer. Um, in the right, sorry, in the left column, you'll see various organizations clearly endorsing the practice of very aggressive palliative care, even if it's so aggressive that it hastens the patient's death. The American Medical Association. Patients have an obligation to relieve pain. This includes providing effective palliative treatment, even though it may foreseeably hasten death. The American Nurses Association. Yada yada, even when interventions entail substantial risks of faking death, the National Hospice Organization. Yada yada, these unintended consequences may hasten death caused by the underlying disease, the American Geriatric Society. Last set the phrase, knowing that the medication may have the unintended effect of hastening a patient's death. So every one of these organizations is okay with people being given painkillers that actually cause death, which have the foreseeable consequence of causing death. However, every one of them opposes physician aid in dying. 
because it's too risky. So I, now I'd like to describe very briefly my mother's death. She is in a nursing home. She's had Alzheimer's. She's incompetent. My dad is clearly the, pro the appointed proxy. And I was present at the conversation. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Mayo, there's nothing more we can do for your wife. Oh, well, you'll keep her comfortable, won't you? Yes, we'll keep her comfortable. Now, what was going on there? Was that, oh, we'll keep her comfortable. I mean, whether this doctor aggressively gave her palliative care to end it or not, who knows? That wasn't part of the discussion. I don't think that's typically going to be part of that very common discussion where someone says, there's nothing we can do for your father or your mother. Well, you'll keep her or him comfortable, won't you? That just isn't a setting where people have careful discussions about what exactly is going on, what exactly are you going to give them, will this hasten death, won't it hasten death. But the establishment view seems to be that it's okay to hasten death just so you don't intend it. Now the objections to physician aid in dying by and large seem to me to be that this is way too risky. Doctors mustn't kill, well, at least not intentionally. But what goes on in these cases of aggressive palliative care are that there are no checks, there's no confirmation that this is what the patient wanted, the family or the patient are not told that this is what is going on, and whether or not the patient gets aggressive care, as I would hope I would get if I was in this situation, is pretty much left to the doctor's intuitions. I made this point at a at a rounds at one of the two hospitals about 15 years ago, and I'm happy to say I don't remember which one, and a doctor raised his hand and said, well, that never happens in this hospital. And another doctor said, Fred, why are you saying that? So the current practice is that this goes on, but the patient just isn't necessarily in the loop. And that seems to me just a terrible thing. Now, I'd like to make a final argument, if I have time to do it, which is to put this in terms of this slippery slope. The argument is made that to take the step to allow patients to actively end their own lives is to proceed down a slope, and of course, if we look further down the slope, there could be all sorts of horrible things. Uh, I suggest that we step down to the slope when we accepted the doctrine of informed consent. When, hot, when, when the notion of hospice first came to this country, there was screaming and hollering. What, you're going to let patients decide they don't want aggressive treatment? Outrageous. What, you're going to let people withdraw treatment when they can be kept alive? Outrageous. What, you're going to allow people to, to refuse uh, to, uh, to eat and drink or to deny uh, uh, comatose patients hydration? Outrageous. So it seems to me that the complaints uh, should have started and indeed started long ago. But my final point would be that one man's slippery slope is another man's moral progress. That is, I would see this as a, the next step is restoring control to the patient. Think of various slippery slope arguments. Uh, uh, there were the, uh, the uh, sexist pigs who argued, what, give women the vote? My God, don't do that. There'll be nothing but trouble before you know what they want, jobs. And if you give them jobs, they're gonna want to, they want to get equal pay. And one of these days, one of them's gonna want to be president, for God's sake. Well, you know, some people would see that as more progress. The, uh, the shelterless pig would see it as, as a horrible slope. And I think most movements that some people think involve moral progress, uh, gay rights, well, it's all right if they're around just so they don't hold hands in public. You know, the next thing you know, they're going to want to get married. You know, and they're going to want to, they're going to want even, even people who don't approve of it to do it, too. Uh, and, and uh, you know, think of civil rights or any movement at all, it seems to me, what some people see is just a descent into a terrible situation. Uh, others see as more progress. So, thank you for your time. Well, thank you. I'm really pleased to be here. I appreciate you being included in this illustrious panel. And I just add, I'm, I'm actually now School of Public Health with a program in Human Rights and Health, uh, Human Rights and Medicine when we were up in medical school. And uh, I, uh, I'm going to have a little bit more of a public health framework.
framing to my uh, remarks. And secondly, uh, just to give you a little more background, at one time I was a vis visiting preceptor at the Hennepin County Medical Examiner's Office. And I'm one who's actually not afraid to use the word assisted suicide. In fact, uh, Holland, which was the vanguard of this practice and many other practices, still uses that term. It's called help by self toting, which is Dutch for help by self killing, which is Dutch for help by suicide. And I think the Dutch in this regard are much more honest than we are, much more honest than Oregon, much more honest than Minnesota, much more honest, honest than Washington, and much more honest than uh, California. Now, here's the, um, here is the bill, and it says it's adopting compassionate care for terminally ill patients, which seems to um, take in a lot of territory implying that we don't have compassionate care for terminally ill patients. And I think hospice care workers and palliative care doctors might be surprised by that. So what's compassion? Well, in the root of it, compassion means accompaniment in suffering. And I think we need to look at the broader context and ask, is this what is offered with a lethal prescription? Okay, now while faith and language of patient autonomy, assisted suicide or aid in dying or death with dignity, help by self totem, uh, it affects more than autonomy. It fundamentally transforms the medical practice. It corrupts physicians and medical and public health records, and I'll give concrete examples. There's dangers to vulnerable patients, but not uh, um, contrary assertions notwithstanding. There's issues of errant diagnosis and prognosis. There's spillover effects into conventional suicide. And the way it's done in Oregon, Washington, and the way it's mirrored here, the practice makes investigation of malfeasance almost impossible. Now, we could go all the way back to Hippocratic Oath and, and ethics, <laughs> and, and David did. Uh, but it's very striking that in the age without much analgesics, there was a statement, I will give no deadly medicine to anyone if asked or suggest any counsel. No pharmacon tanasamon, no deadly pharmacon. And of course, um, Brittany Maynard has brought a lot of attention to the topic, and many people have found Brittany Maynard's story an example inspirational, and in fact, she's a person of great courage, no doubt about it. But also, unexpected people have found her example quite inspiring. So, here's a week of December 2014. A mother brought in her 20 year old son for an emergency appointment. She had told me that he had been acting oddly and talking about death. This is Will Johnson, an MD in British Columbia. During the appointment, I asked the man if he had a plan, which is always a good thing to ask somebody, actually, just as a lay person, if somebody's talking like this, okay? He said yes. He had watched Miss Maynard's video, and he was very impressed and identified with her, and he thought it was a very good idea for him to die like her. He also told me after watching the video, he had been surfing the internet looking for ways to obtain suicide drugs. He was actively suicidal. So how does uh, legalization of physician-assisted suicide affect suicide rates? Now, this is the first uh, um, cry at it, or uh, October 2015 just came out. And one thing that's quite interesting is if you look at the states that are adopting this, the early adopters, is this thing looking here? Am I aiming well? Okay. Now, here are all the states. This is the suicide rates of all the states that do not have it, PAS. Now, here's Washington State. Here's Oregon State. Here's Montana. So the states of the early adopters are in fact the ones that have a real problem with suicide, and the trend lines are, are continuing. Now they had some results, and I've, I've actually been in correspondence with the researchers here about some of their variables and some of their models and stuff, but I think it's a, a decent first shot at it. Um, so they associated the legalization of assisted suicide, and by the way, PAS still shows up in Oregon URLs at, at different places, um, compared to non-PAS states. So an 8.9% increase in total suicide rates and controlling for state and year effects. 11.8 increase, adding demographic and socioeconomic factors, including 4.4 in non-PAS. And when you add the heavy trend lines, the general trend lines, if you notice, remember there's a big drop around 2000 down there, the good economic times maybe, and, and other things. Um, there's 6.3% increase adding the state time trend, so the PAS positive coefficient then falls below significance. Well, in general, it tends to be in high suicide rates, increasing rates, and some of the theory was, well, maybe this would actually cut back on suicide because you would have options outside of doing something more drastic or messy or something like this, but in fact, it doesn't show that. In fact, the CDC Morbidity Mortality Weekly Report for 1999 to 2010 for suicide between 35 and 64 shows Oregon 49% increase, Wyoming 79% increase, Vermont 58% increase, and California is at plus 17, so we'll just have to wait and see what happens now. Natural experiment before and after. 
Okay, eligible patients may have years to live. Oregon, Washington laws of Minnesota apply to people with, quote, six months prognosis, which, as mentioned, was the hospice benefit, right? Now, that's without treatment. The Minnesota bill does not require a with treatment prognosis. Every medically dependent patient is eligible if they're on dialysis, if they're a type 1 diabetic, insulin dependent, if they've had their thyroid move, removed or on thyroxin, uh, thyroxin uh, medication. And what about the six months? Well, here's Jeanette Hall in 2000 who was diagnosed with terminal cancer and given six months to live and decided to use Oregon's law where her, uh, her physician sort of said, well, I think we should work on this a little more. And she did, and this is Jeanette Hall 15 years later. So they were only off by 14 and a half years in counting. And is this just a one offer with one person? Well, what about the six months? Well, here's a study in the Washington Post on leaving hospice alive. In Washington, Oregon, 15 to 20% leave the hospice alive, and all of those people are eligible for this. And if you read the Oregon documents and reports, here's a person that died, right, at six months and 180 days, right? Here's a person that died 1,009 days after the first request. And perhaps we, um, hospice is usually great in palliative care. Actually, palliative care and hospice aren't exactly the same. Palliative care takes place within a hospice context. And the discussion of palliative care, but in fact, the fact that palliative care is sort of boxed in with end of life and death is a, is a medical model mistake. And there's, that's another discussion and maybe a good one for another event. But um, bad hospice practice is at a risk for a factor of persistent suicide requests. There's a long uh, series in the Washington Post, about five articles. And here's one, part one. Terminal neglect, how some hospices decline to treat the dying. Okay? Now, if, you're, if you have different comorbidities that can be treated and the hospice isn't doing that, you're more likely to be in pain, you're more likely to request an end. Okay? And here's part four. As more hospices enroll patients who aren't dying, questions about lethal doses arise. And in here, in this particular article, there's a story of a family um, in which the medical directives were ignored for aggressive treatment and in fact, um, the person was put into a very aggressive morphine regimen and died. And the, one of the siblings said, well, it was because the cousins or the, the other siblings were actually going after the inheritance at the time because of their financial situation. Now, in 2015, the Oregon bill was introduced to increase eligibility to one-year prognosis. That's before hospice Medicare eligibility and even more reliability. And then let me just move to a question. If there were corruption of physicians, if there were falsification and destruction of medical and public health documents as standard practice, practice, practice sorry, um, would that be a sign that something's wrong? Does anybody think if they destroyed the public health documents, and would that be a problem? Or would that be good medical public health practice? Well, this is treated unlike any other thing. So here's 105 cases in Oregon in 2014. First of all, 11 people with the arrow uh, died from prescriptions written in multiple previous years. Okay, then down here it says 105 died from ingesting the medication. That seems pretty clear. But then over here it says zero regained consciousness after ingesting medication and died of an underlying illness. Okay, so the material and efficient cause, if you're thinking of Aristotle's four causes, formal, efficient, right, final, okay, material. So the material efficient cause is clearly the Rx, but the extended cause is illness. Now, interesting, pentobarbital is the um, preferred uh, drug in Oregon, and it's used in executions in 15 states. So it's pretty clear what's actually killing the patient. And when a patient lives, it's considered a medical failure. Now the bill, including the bill here that's in the Minnesota bill, which is just copying Oregon, and Washington, the attending physician may sign the qualified patient's death certificate that shall list the underlying terminal illness as the cause of death. Now, when, we were at the, when I was at the medical examiner's office, we took death certificates pretty seriously because they're supposed to be an accurate record of what's actually causing the physiological death, okay? It's supposed to be an accurate record. It's not a social mollification um, exercise. It's supposed to be an accurate record. <coughs> well, this demands that the physician corrupt their integrity and write something which isn't true. If you take an overdose of phenobarbital, you died of that. Let's say, I, I used to skydive before I was married, <laughs> and I got grounded. But let's say you don't like you don't like this. Uh, I still wanted to. But, you know, it's socially not accepted to crater, you know. So uh, anyway, um, let's say let's say it's not your style to to, to swill down this uh, milkshake of pentobarbital. Let's say you want to go out on a glorious sunset load, and you just do a no pull. You'll be dead very quick by doing that when you hit the ground. Okay, same motivation, same everything. 
but the death certificate will say multiple for uh, blunt force trauma. In the Netherlands, by the way, I was talking to a professor that actually gave a very interesting talk on the, for the Center of Bioethics, and it's on the website. I mentioned this to him, and he was shocked. He said the Netherlands lists the material cause of death and records it as an unnatural death. He said transparency requires that we do this. So I think transparency requires accuracy as does taking responsibility for actions. This includes the actions of physicians, the actions of healthcare systems, and the actions of patients. And interestingly, in Washington State, here's the directions. The medical examiners, the coroners, and the prosecuting attorneys are supposed to be looking at the malfeasance. If somebody has been formally is, uh, taken a medication under this, they are charged to, in fact, mark it as natural when it's not. They are charged to never mention the act and even the legislation under which it was uh, provided. They are charged to not even mention the actual agent which caused the death. Now, what about confidence, mental illness, and vulnerability? And there seem to be some, some good things, you know, some, some things to look at. Well, confidence is very widely described as understand, acknowledge the nature and consequences of healthcare decisions, including benefits and disadvantages of treatments to make informed decisions, and communicate the decision to a healthcare provider. Okay. But the definition of competent qualified in Minnesota doesn't exclude somebody who has severe untreated depression or require referral of treatment. But the general practitioner, who's not a mental health expert, in fact, just thinks that the person wants to die because of the disease, not because they have clinical depression, then they don't have to be referred. And there's been cases that have been quite notorious. The Michael Friedland case, he ended up actually not taking the drug um, in which people were given uh, the drugs to severely depressed individuals. Now, when any of these things, which um, Senator Eaton had up there with the, with the um, percentages a little earlier, would any of these things be related to clinical depression? You know, well, we're talking about 91%, 88%, 79%, 50%, and 40%. I don't want to be a burden on family care, caregivers, and friends. And what's interesting that uh, pain control and concern about pain is way down there, about 25%. And what's, what's the high things are really the social wraparound issues, the value, the value of a human being as they start losing capacity, how they see themselves or how they're worried about other people to see them. The bill also allows for proxy communication of decisions through a person familiar with the patient's manner of communicating. So if you have a person with severe cerebral palsy, something like that, who doesn't communicate very well, whoever is speaking for them can request this. And if you know anything about patient abuse and, uh, and disability abuse, there are no small number of cases in, in, that uh, persons have had their lives ended by their caregivers because they thought they would be better off in that state. And not surprisingly, the majority of disability organizations and communities are, are against this. So you have the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network, the Disability Rights Center, Disability Rights Education Defense Fund, Justice for All, National Council on Disability, National Council on Independent Living, National Spinal Cord Injury Association, not dead yet, World Association of Persons with Disability. Now there are some people like Stephen Hawking, for example, who is for this and it's fine, but Stephen Hawking is a professor at Cambridge with lots of money, with all the technology he could ever want. If you look at unemployment people with severe disabilities, and poverty among people that have severe disabilities. It's a whole different story in terms of vulnerabilities. Now, we mentioned the psychiatric piece. There's 5.5 referral for psychiatric issues in, um, in Oregon. And what happens is the uh, physician and, and, uh, would say, okay, you should go for a review. So this form is sent to the psychologist or psychiatrist, depending on the case. And if it's completed, it's not filed independently of that person. It's filed back to the physician who's not required to file any paperwork until the person is dead. However, the form is pre-checked to find every person for whom that form is returned for competent. It says, I have determined through evaluation the above named patient is not suffering from psychiatric or psychological disorder or depression, causing impaired judgment and conformance with ORS 127.825. And it's checked in advance. Well, this is a push document. This is actually an unethical document. This is a document that tells, before seeing the patient in advance, what the finding should be, and there's no independent filing of this thing. So there's not even a no box to check. Well, so I was sort of curious about this, so I contacted Oregon a couple of days ago. And here's the, here's the questions. In the case of a negative finding of non-competence, is there any independent filing that is not dependent on the referring physician to communicate? <coughs> No, for non-competence cases, the patient would not be eligible for DWDA medication. Therefore, no DWDA forms that is required as, it, as uh, the medication was never prescribed. Is there any requirement that a negative finding be communicated? No, see the above. 
On the attending uh, physician follow-up form and chronology and death certificate extract form, how long are they completed? Are the completed forms kept on file? Along with all the other DWDA required forms, we destroy the follow-up form and extract forms and paperwork after a year. So there's no tracing. If there's any kind of malfeasance, you know, I'm in I'm in health policy research. Uh, that's where I have a lectureship, and I like to be able to study physician prescribing practices. I like to 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 look at data vectors that have individual patient information on this. It's impossible to ask the question: Is there a, is there a physician or a psychiatrist or anybody else out there for whom an unusually high number of people in similar situations are referred and end up in this particular category? So if a patient were declared non-competent by five psychiatric evaluators, there would be no record of it with the Oregon Health Authority. And then if the number six was, was found and said, oh yeah, I think okay, and maybe number six thinks that everybody pretty much should have this right un unabridgedly, then there would be no record of the other five. So this is, this is highly protective of patients, I would think. Actually, I don't think that's highly protective of patients. So, well, certainly the Oregon Health Authority investigates suspicious cases, and that's why we're patterning ourselves after Oregon. Well, guess what? Dr. Katrina Hedberg, uh, who's a very pleasant person, uh, said, we are not given the resources to investigate assisted suicide cases, and not only that, we do not have the resources to do it, but we do not have any legal authority to insert ourselves. So if there's anything suspicious, and they're the only ones that's giving the documentation, they don't have the resources to investigate, and they don't have the authority to investigate, but then they destroy all the linking documentation after a year. So guess what? It doesn't seem to me like anybody could investigate very well after the fact either. So even if the Oregon Health Authority won't or can investigate, surely we can count on professional self-policing, right? Because we can, we can count on professional groups like nursing groups and other groups to hold their members to high standards of practice accountability. Well, here's an example of Oregon where two nurses are investigated uh, for assisted suicide case, in fact, it was direct euthanasia. They killed a patient without a physician being involved. Two pulmonary nurses have admitted to the Oregon State Board of Nursing they administered massive doses of morphine and phenobarbital to a woman dying of cancer with the intention of causing her death. Okay, so under the Oregon law, this is actually a chargeable offense. Okay, it's a direct illegal act of euthanasia admitted by two nurses with the intent to cause the death. The professional organization did not report it to the police and they weren't charged with this part after the one year or investigation. Okay, well that sounds like protection. Now what about uh, coercion or undue influence? Now there's a nice thing, actually I like this in your, I don't think this was in uh, exactly like this in the Oregon bill, I liked it better in the Minnesota bill, um, where it said, well if you have coercion or if you falsify documents or you have a forgery or you have coercion, undue influence, you can be up for a attempted murder or murder charge. Well that sounds like a little bit of a punch, okay? But there's no definition of what constitutes undue influence. I have an interesting example maybe later. Um, the bill also allows, mentioned that you can't have an, an, an two interested parties in there, but that's not what the law says. What it says is you can't have two family members sign it. A bill allows an heir and their boyfriend to be the sole witnesses for the request. The bill also allows a designated agent to pick up the drug. That could be the, 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 uh, the, the child or the boyfriend. And they could prepare it. Once the drug is issued, there's no control over what's happening to the drug. Okay, now, could physicians be affected by the practice? So we're sort of in health services research. We're interested in spillover effects, externalities, you know, negative effects that, that you don't cause, haven't been responsible for, or positive things that you get benefit of and you don't pay for. So here's from an elder care facility owner in Washington State. My husband and I operate two adult family homes in Washington State where assisted suicide is legal. And they first mentioned the first day after the, um, the thing was passed, there was a person whose son came and asked for how they get the pills, and it wasn't the father that was asking for those. And then they said, during the election, the law promoted as the right of individual people to make their own choices. That has not been our experience. We have also noticed a shift in attitudes in the, of doctors and nurses toward the typically elderly clients to eliminate their choices. Certainly not everybody, but here's some data. And since then, we've noticed that some members of the medical profession are quick to bring out the morphine to begin comfort care without considering treatment. Now this is consistent with, with that Washington Post report. Remember the first one, we talked about certain hospitals that are treating comorbidities and other things. And sometimes they do this on their own without telling the client or the family member in charge of the client's care. That doesn't sound like a big score for autonomy to me. <coughs> so here's the bad hospice practice. Okay, um, you know, terminal neglect how some hospices decline to treat the dying. This is the five part Washington Post series. Here's number four, as more hospices enroll patients who aren't dying, questions about lethal doses arise. 
And in this situation, what about the poor people that have not as good of health care as the rich people? Well, here's people on the Oregon Health Plan. Uh, this is covered, the physician says it's suicide or death of dignity or whatever one wants to call it. It's covered for everybody on the Oregon Health Plan, but not every treatment. In fact, the treatment, there's a list of priority treatments, and depending on the budget, where the chalk line is, moves every year. So this year, there's a budget surplus, so you can get this treatment. Last year, you couldn't get it. Next year, you can't get it, okay? So here's somebody, Barbara Wagner, um, <coughs> oncologist prescribed a cancer drug. It was a little bit pricey, um, but uh, it would give cover, it should be covered, and it was rejected, but she received a letter saying, however, you have palliative care options, including the lethal option at the end. Now, here's a question. This is an Australian poll that I'm about done. Should euthanasia be legal? And here's sort of the span and talking about slippery slopes or how, where do you want to stop the boat? And different cultures and different polities may stop it at different places, by the way. So yes is an option to include everyone, including children, as in Belgium, which includes psychiatric patients. Yes is adults suffering unbearably. In, in the Netherlands, if you're, um, if you're tired of living, um, you can receive uh, euthanasia as well. And in Switzerland, there's somebody who just didn't want to grow old, and they were given a uh, lethal prescription. Um, yes for just adults with terminal illnesses in Oregon, or not at all. Well, Art Kaplan, who uh, was the first uh, director of the Center for Biopics here in Minnesota, wrote this uh, article about euthanasia in Belgium and the Netherlands on a slippery slope. A couple of studies, and he says both studies report worrisome findings that might seem to validate concerns, that seem to validate concerns about where these practices might lead, and it's a good time to sort of reconsider what's going on in the United States as well and with the medical profession. Now, this is an example, and we don't have this here, but there's a question if it's about suffering, Okay, here you have self-ingestion. Well, what if a person is paralyzed and has a swallowing disorder and is fed by a feeding tube? Well, maybe they can dump it into the feeding tube themselves. But what if they can't use their hands that well? Okay, then is that just okay if their, their parents do it or, or somebody else does it? Okay, so then we're into direct euthanasia. So this is an outcomes request for 100 Belgian patients, patients suffering from psychiatric disorders or uh, uh, for unbearable suffering, uh, quote unquote, who are asking to receive a a, either euthanasia or, well, in Belgium, euthanasia covers um, self-administration and not self-administration, okay? But there's some interesting things going on here. It turns out there's some real gender bias evidence going on in here. So here we go, and here are all the different age ranges here. So 21, 30, 41, 50, 61, 70, 80. And here are the males, okay? Now, if you notice here, when you get up to 81, of course, you get much above this, there aren't that many guys left, right? It's, when we're out living that. But here, okay, 21 to 30, okay, there's a few more women that are asking for a lethal, a lethal solution to their mental illness. Here, there's four or five, four times that. Here, it's almost five times the women. Here, it's about the same. Here, it's about three or four times the women. Well, why is this? Well, women are often diagnostic, fulfill diagnostic criteria for mental disorders more often than men, except for substance abuse. So all of these people, all those women, this great, huge preponderance are all eligible for a lethal solution there. And this is a, the, last, uh, the last two slides, and this is a little tight to see, but it's interesting. So one of the questions, are there general externalities on the medical care that could be seen related to the timing of the beginning of the practice of euthanasia or assisted suicide in the Netherlands? Now, it was illegal until about 1991, but by the time we hit 1991, Something like 3% of all deaths were either assisted suicide, euthanasia imposed, including 1,000 without request. Okay? So what's interesting here, okay, um, so here we have, that's Nederland, this is in Dutch, sorry, this is from a Dutch acquaintance of mine. Italy, France, and <coughs> EU 15, so 15 EU countries together. So this is crude mortality per 100,000, and so you see here in 1970, when this, before, about the time this practice first started to emerge, you see, okay, France is doing best for women, and then the Netherlands is under 800, right? And then Italy here, and actually the EU 15 is not so great. But as the time goes on, the practice continues, guess what? Here we go. Here's the first Remelent report. Here's the first official um, allowance. It's still quoted illegal because it's then allowed, and then basically decriminalized. And so now the crude mortality rate in the Netherlands is higher than any of the other countries, where before it was quite a bit better. And for men, the, the difference is even strong, starker. Now, of course, guys are dying more than women at every age and every stage, which is you know prenatal to, to the end. But here, so 1,200 to here, so it's they're you know they're about 20% or 10% over here. 
So here it is with men, the same story here was going on. Now, things were getting better on the general slope because we're figuring out how to save people from HIV AIDS, right? We can treat that and people aren't dying from that. But you actually see um, that in, in Holland, you see their crude mortality rate is rising relative to the others. And the huge distinguishing factor is the change in practices. And in fact, when they talk about also um, the rates of other uh, life shortening uh, uh, interventions in Holland, um, that's very consistent with this story. So is it just about autonomy and control? Well, it's also about the fundamental transformation of medical practice, the corruption of physician integrity, medical and public health records, competency, which is broad but allows severe depression and a six-month prognosis without treatment, and medically dependent, all being eligible, and spillovers into medical, non-medical suicide and practice changes and attitudes that are subtle but, but actually of importance. And a, not a good definition for undue influence and the allowing the heir and a, and a boyfriend to be able to get the drug. And it's opposed by the vast majority of disability organizations and violations, as I've shown, are not held accountable while destroying the records necessary for accountability. That's supposed to be the model that we're emulating, and I think it's a bad model, and it's got problems on multiple dimensions. And with that, I thank you. We're going to start here with questions between the panelists. Um, and what I'd like to do is, um, panelists, if you want to ask a question, raise your hand. I'll call on you so we can keep some sort of order. Doc, well, let me try a, a couple of responses. I have. Uh, I'm a numbers man, I'm a little dazzled, I don't have a good view of the screen. Uh, just a couple of very specific points. Uh, the, I, I think it is a pity that people who do this uh, are, not, uh, are not described as suicides. I'm a sort of a purist, it seems to me this is physician-assisted suicide. I think there are a couple of reasons for that. One is there's a huge taboo around suicide, so that if uh, one of the 30% who think this is a perfectly terrible thing finds out that their father committed suicide, or their uncle committed suicide, that is a very bad thing. There are also insurance arguments involved. Uh, I, uh, I want to make a, a, a second trivial point, and that is that it's been argued that when the Hippocratic Oath speaks of not uh, uh, giving uh, poison to anyone, uh, Steve Miles, who is also at the Bioethics Center, has done a book on the Hippocratic Oath, argues that this is really an admonition for physicians not to get involved in political murders. Uh, I will not accept the advice of anyone to give poison to anyone uh, who knows exactly what was going on there. But I would just invite the general consideration of how many of these uh, abuses, risks, difficulties, etc., apply to double effect deaths. Uh, Kurt mentioned the, uh, the two, two nurses who were, uh, who were accused of murder. I, I, I've talked to two people who, were, who described to me what looked like very fishy, uh, a, a double effect of palliative care deaths. I taught a course in, uh, in medical ethics to some nurses, and when we were talking about this, one nurse raised her hand and said, oh yes, I remember a case where orders were given for what was clearly a lethal dose, for a dying patient. Uh, uh, half of it was to be given just before I went off duty, and the other half was to be given before the, as soon as the next nurse came on. So it was designed that neither of the nurses would feel, and in fact neither of the nurses did, deliver what was clearly a lethal dose, but what was clearly intended to be a lethal dose. A second anecdote was from a doctor who had done a residency at Mass General, one of the premier institutions, described hearing a physician saying, uh, give X dose of morphine and double it every hour. At the end of 10 hours, that would be a, t a thousand times the original dose, and at the end of 20 hours, it would be a million times the original dose. Uh, so let me, let me pose, uh, of course these nurses admitted to the intent of killing someone, uh, so I guess that's what made it murder. Imagine the following. Imagine that Mayo is clearly in favor of this. Imagine he finds a doctor who's clearly in favor of it. The law doesn't pass. Mayo's at the terminal stage of illness. And I say, Doc, I really wish that you would give me a lethal dose because I really want to be out of my misery. And he says, Doc, I'd really like to give you a lethal dose to put you out of my misery, but I can't intend your death. And I say, well then just give me the lethal dose to kill the pain. Don't intend my death. 
is it even logically possible for me to want to get the lethal dose so that I die, and him to want to get the lethal dose knowing that I'll die without him intending it? And the, where the law is draws the line now is between someone foreseeing that this will be lethal, but they don't intend it, versus giving the lethal dose and intending it. And by the way, when people die, these double effect deaths from these <coughs> doses that can be foreseen but aren't intended to kill, that doesn't appear on the death certificate as murder. It appeared that the cause of death is not a massive dose of painkiller or even any dose of painkiller. The, the, the cause of death is the cancer, which would have killed the person a few days later if they hadn't got the medication. So I think not all, perhaps, but many of these shenanigans that Kurt points out are, are operating uh, 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 just as clearly in current practice. Again, we stepped on the, on the slope. The minute doctors quit doing everything they possibly could to keep people alive and started taking account of the fact that at a certain point, life has become so marginal that it's not worth doing everything possible to keep people alive. And it still seems to me your best bet is to try to have the person whose life is at issue be the one whose values determine when that happens. And it's going to be messy. It's never going to be clean. Yeah, I was wondering, from Senator Eaton, whether your the intent of the bill is to have the data destruction practices that are now done in Oregon and in Washington State. My bill is pretty fluid, but that is how it's written at this point. Um, we've not seen any. Mainly, the reason is that if you put down that someone had uh, caused their own death, that it would uh, damage some insurance, but most usually only if it's less than a year old. Actually, so, though, the, the, there is a clause for protective of health insurance that anything that happens underneath this bill will not affect the health insurance uh, payouts. So, and that could actually be preserved even by after putting accurate information on a death certificate. My concern also with that is that you lose a lot of important data with um, for people who are keeping track of who has what kinds of cancer and what kinds of illnesses. All of that's left off then. And you, you know, that's... On, on death certificates, there's space for secondary causes. There's the, the cause and the manner of death and frequently multiple things are listed on death certificates. Our second. Um, here I'm speaking for myself. Um, Senator Eden, can you help us understand why the act Eight and nine, if not suicide. Uh, I mean, for throughout most of history and philosophy, if you perform an action where your intent is to end your life, it's called suicide. So it seems to me, I don't understand that. If you could help me understand that, I'd appreciate it. Well, I spent over 40 years working in mental health, and someone who's suicidal um, wants to die. They're they're actively, they're in emotional pain, and they want it, they just want to be gone. Um, I've spent my lifetime convincing them there was life ahead and um, working with them to find hope. The uh, person who uses the death with dignity are dying. They don't necessarily want to die. They are dying. Their life has become miserable. The um, hospice or palliative care is not meeting their needs. Life no longer has any meaning to them, and they just want to die sooner than they would if they went through the end of the excruciating agony of what their prognosis gives them. Um, you know, I understand that a lot of people who, um, that for religious reasons, oppose this, and I respect that. I have no problem with that. This country is founded on um, religious freedom. That's the foundation of our democracy. We're not the Taliban here, we're not the whatever. You're allowed to practice your religion as you seem fit. And to move the death back a 
month, a couple months, whatever. It's, it's just hastening an already dying person's death. They're already dying. They, they will not, there's nothing you can do that can stop that process. I, I think I'd like to make a comment about that. Jeanette Hall was already dying, and she's around 15 years later. For example, 20% of the people graduate from hospice, 15 to 20% in Washington and in Oregon. And, and additionally, when I was at the medical examiner's office, there were multiple people that came through that ended their lives, and all of them thought they had a good reason to do so, except for one. One gal had embezzled from her roommates and couldn't face the shame of it. Um, and, and let me just say one more, then I'll drop it. Um, and then clearly in places like uh, Switzerland and the Netherlands and Belgium, psychiatric indications are also accepted because it has to do with, quote, unbearable suffering. And I appreciate your good work, actually, because the mental health nursing is a very hard area to work in. And so forth. Yeah. Sorry. Well, number one, we're in the United States. I don't really care what Belgium and Sweden and whatever go. Um, we have a lot of data from Oregon that shows that this works very well. In 20 years, almost 20 years, um, nobody's tried to change the um, precautions. Nobody's tried to, nobody's been caught um, breaking any of the rules or um, coercing anyone or anything like that. And you would think that if this was an issue that it would have happened by now. And I, you know, in, in Oregon their population is like 90% or maybe it's 80% white, and they had 90% um, of the people who used this were white. It's, and they were higher income, and they were college educated. So it's, um, it's not the poor, disabled people who are taken advantage of and talked into dying. This is, this is something that people who are in agony choose because they don't want to live like that anymore. It's not worth it to them anymore. I've seen these people, and it's very, it's a small number. A lot of times palliative care and hospice work very, very well. I strongly support them and think we underfund them. I think we need to educate more people on it. It's a great, great service. But uh, for some people, it reaches the point of where um, it, the agony is just more than they care to live with. Could I, could I pick up on that? I, there, the argument is often made that, that, that this would somehow detract from improving hospice care. I mean, I want to second the notion that, we, that, that hospice care is terribly important. Uh, as I say, I think it's the, the, the gold standard and there's better and worse hospice care. I think money should be put into that. But the argument that we mustn't uh, uh, allow people who are very near death to end their lives because that would detract from the effort to improve hospice care seems to me perfectly analogous to the argument that we certainly mustn't spend money on school lunches because that's going to detract from efforts to improve the economy and get everybody a job. I mean, here you have an immediate case right here of a hungry kid. And uh, it may be that funding the school lunch program is going to take some of the pressure off uh, from improving the economy or, or, or uh, finding jobs. But that seems to be a crazy argument. You've got the immediate case in front of you. Addressing that case isn't somehow going to undercut support for hospice. And, and, and again, most of these people, 90% who use this bill, are in hospice care. It's an extension of hospice care in, 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 in 90% of the cases. Well, um, I guess, I think we're all, and this is me, myself, and I, I think we're all in agreement that we need to work harder to improve palliative care in hospice. I hope we are. But I would point out that palliative care is misdefined in the legislation. I'm going to read it. Line 2.24 following. Palliative care means health care centered on a terminally ill patient and the patient's family that, colon, one, optimizes the patient's quality of life by anticipating, preventing, and treating the patient's suffering through the continuum of the patient's terminal illness, semicolon. Two, 
addresses the physical, emotional, social, and spiritual needs of the patient, semicolon three, facilitates patient autonomy, the patient's access to information, and patient choice, semicolon, and four, includes but is not limited to discussions between the patient and a healthcare provider concerning the patient's goals for treatment options available to the patient, including hospice care and comprehensive pain and symptom <coughs> management. A current understanding of palliative care would use those same terms, but palliative care is used for patients also in which we're going for cure. So this is a misdefinition in the bill. And she just handed me the World Health definition of palliative care. <laughs> <laughs> Let me read it. I read it a couple weeks ago. It's um I, I would agree that the it needs to be clarified in the bill. The distinction is that palliative care is provided for patients receiving aggressive curative treatments to improve their quality of life. Hospice care is similar care that is for those who are terminally ill and dying. And I think that's a very important distinction that we all need to understand. And if you go in the hospitals here, even healthcare professionals are confused about it. Did you want to get it too, or did you? Oh, no, just the, the side question about it. We would have seen it, but as I demonstrated in the slides, there's no investigative authority for the Oregon Health Board, et cetera, et cetera. So who's going to investigate it? And when the documentation is destroyed, it makes it a little hard to determine where there's been abuses. And when the uh, medical examiners and everybody's forced to not be honest about what's on the death certificate, it makes it really hard to come together and put a case series together about physician prescribing practices and influence and what counts for undo or do. So I think uh, there's some structural issues there that are not really surmountable by saying, well, we haven't found anything. Well, the thing is set up not to find anything. Now, there may not be much, and there are certainly um, maverick personalities and all sorts of people um, who want this, and they do it on their own, and they won't be coerced, and all those things, you know, sort of ideal case individuals. Um, the, the bit about um, being high income, uh, Margaret Dora, who's an elder care of the, um, attorney, points out that um, people with lots of assets are also people that are not infrequently the, the target of elder care abuse, um, and specifically, not only, um, well, in part at times from uh, children and other relatives and whatever. So being, just because you have high assets, it doesn't mean that you're not protected, but, but there is true, it's very interesting that there's very different cultural attitudes in different ethnic and other communities toward this. Um, and you do see this primarily as a Caucasian phenomenon. You don't see it much in the American Indian community. You don't see it in the African American or black community. And in fact, regular, uh, if you want to call it regular suicide, there's very, in Minnesota, there's very high rates of uh, homicide in the Native American community and also in the uh, African American community. Pretty high rates of uh, suicide in the Native American community, very sadly. But the black community is lower than the white community. And so there's, there, it's really true that there's real differences in how people and sort of groups approach these things. And so there's a lot of cultural wraparound, which goes back to my, my, the question of how does, if people are in despair because I'm losing capacity, that's also related to a number of cultural things and not just physiological things. Dr. Sandy. No, well, I, I guess I, um, and I'm speaking for myself, um, I'm not sure that the safeguards in the proposed legislation are secure enough. Um, one of the nice things, whatever else you feel about it, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, otherwise known as Obamacare, the words patient protection were in there for a reason. The bill has driven an increased need in medicine for quality and transparency on our outcomes with organizations being held accountable for their behaviors. And I am concerned, as Dr. Allison is, he's leveled what I think are probably some pretty devastating critiques about potential problems here. It seems to me this practice is driven underground, is secret, and not transparent. And there is no way to monitor it. I think even advocates like Peter Singer, who is a world-class utilitarian philosopher, says he's a fierce advocate of physician-assisted suicide. He also says 
we need to monitor the practice? Well, there, it is monitored. I mean, there are uh, reports are filed. Uh, I assume that if someone is applying for this and uh, a doctor decides that you're not competent, there's no point in him checking the box that you're not competent and then going in to file it. I, I just don't see that such a, you know, that such a form would go anywhere. Uh, uh, our friend Art Kaplan, who is the person I added down to this quote, said, uh, the fears are real, they just don't fit the facts. I'm reminded of the friend who was asked if he believed in baptism. He said, believe in the hell, I've seen it happen. I mean, people have these fears, but, but they just don't seem to be backed up by uh, what data there is. No, a, a second point, notice that people who have mean families can be bullied into hospice. In fact, maybe it isn't even that bad. Maybe if there was more family around or the family was more supportive, someone would decide to have the second colon surgery. People decide to make all kinds of decisions which they would have made differently and more favorably if the social circumstances had been different. Susie might not have decided to marry Fred if he hadn't gotten her pregnant and it might result in a miserable marriage that ruins a couple of lives. People make all kinds of really important decisions uh, without all kinds of safeguards. Incompetent people decide to get married. Uh, they go skiing, they go rock climbing, they get motorcycles, they buy guns. Uh, letting people, liberty is a risky business. On, on that note, why don't I open it to Q&A from the audience?